We want to start our museum midday by recognizing that the Tongas Historical Museum and Totem Heritage Center are located on the traditional lands of the Tontiquan and Sanyaquan people of the Clinket First Nations. We're grateful for the opportunity to live and learn here in mutual respect and appreciation. All right, we are very excited to be talking with Diane Benson today for Museum Midday. Um, we're glad that you all were able to join us today uh, for this Museum Midday for October. Uh, and please do check out the full season. Um, but for today, it is a challenge for us to summarize the full scope of Diane's career and work um, from driving a tractor trailer on the Trans-Alaska -Alaska Pipeline to her work as a professor of Alaskan literature and native studies uh, with the University of Alaska system uh, to her run for political office and activism. She's a playwright, writer, speaker, politician, and actress. Um, Diane's perhaps best known for her portrayal of Clinket civil rights leader uh, Elizabeth Karadovich, uh, both through her widely toured and performed play When My Spirit Raised Its Hands, and her portrayal in the PBS documentary For the Rights of All, Ending Jim Crow in Alaska. Um, if throughout today's discussion uh, you have any questions or comments, please feel free to share them in the comments section. Um, we'll be sharing also links uh, to some of what is discussed in the comments section um, so that you can dig deeper and explore and really support Diane Benson's past and current work. Um, we want to thank again Diane, uh, who is joining us from Petersburg. So hello, Diane. Welcome. Goodness, Chish, thank you. And thank you for such a nice introduction. And it's really nice to have, uh, I think it's a special honor to be doing anything with the Ketchikan Museum. So thank you. Um, I would like to go ahead and introduce myself in my own language. Um, Diane Benson, and so just to, because I could go on, this is how we are in Shingit, but um, I am of the Raven Moiti from the Akbentan clan. And I first mentioned that my Shingit name is Ches, and obviously my known name is Diane Benson, otherwise. Um, I think we should just dive right in. And, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's, it's interesting to be offered such an opportunity, uh, especially when one has managed to live as long as I have now and to have a 20 year old grandson and an eight year old granddaughter who I adore, of course. And uh, the gift of being at this age and being able to reflect on one's life and, um, and the things that were done. I think I grew up with Alaska. You know, it's uh, been through all of its changes and somehow been um, involved or maybe even a little instrumental in some things. But I've always loved our history, Alaska history, Tlingit history. And they and the way those things have come together uh, throughout its changes. And the most remarkable to me, of course, has been the story and the, and the most, I think, influential on my life has been the uh, story of Elizabeth Pradovich. And people have often wondered, and I think too often have minimized the role that she's played in our history because they think, oh, she gave a speech, what's the big deal? And actually, she was part of the Alaska Native Sisterhood and her husband with the Alaska Native Brotherhood. And in that really important period uh, during World War II, they were before the, well, she was before, well, they both were before the territorial legislature on the anti-discrimination bill during that time. But it was a long journey to get there and to make that happen. And it was in their roles with the Alaska Native Sisterhood and the Alaska Native Brotherhood that they were able to do as much as they did. And they did a lot of advocacy work and promoting uh, the idea of the anti-discrimination bill. Elizabeth worked those halls of the legislature for two years, you know, to not just during the legislature, but to be during when they're in session, because they only met every two years during territorial times. But it was to constantly be going really after them. 
Now, remember, it was also very difficult to get around those days. So there were uh, to go to, uh, to Nome, for example, uh, was, a, was a big deal. To make their way around Southeast, as we well know, is still a big deal. And they did so by boat. So it's, it's uh, something to keep in mind, like what that kind of dedication. And I would like to go ahead and dispel some myths or some misinformation that's been occurring right Please. now. <laughs> so one of those things is that, um, first, of course, is that Elizabeth didn't do much, and yet she did a, a lot. As, uh, but she did a lot of things quietly. She was actually a humble person. And I've read letters from her that were only written to her family that were shared with me that really demonstrated to me the depth of her love for the people and her family, the, her commitment to true values, her dedication to her faith, to live it, not just talk about it. So she lived it rather than, you know, um, preach. She practiced it. And she was one of those people who um, not only was humble, but was deeply honest and caring and would help others in her community, not for any attention or gain in that regard, but to give and to be uh, productive in the community. They lived in Cloac. So there's this one bit of misinformation that they only went to Juneau and discovered, oh, look at the terrible signs and um, the way we're being treated. We should go after an anti-discrimination bill. It did not happen that way. They were already committed and active. In fact, let's remember that they were only citizens for uh, 20, I think what, 21 years by that point. So there were a lot of things happening uh, and especially the, the seizing of lands during a time when they weren't even uh, citizens. Uh, you know, Native peoples were not citizens and so they couldn't vote and they couldn't own land. And so in the meantime, the very land they'd been on for, you know, eons, they could no longer um, uh, function on because it was overtaken by, by settlers and whatnot and gold seekers and the like. So um, things had to change. And so they were, A and B and A and S were in this constant struggle and they were fighters. Oh my God, they were brilliant. They went out and got the education, you know, the William Pauls and, and his siblings, um, certainly uh, William Paul it is, had children who also uh, were very active. So you had this huge movement by a lot of people of which Roy and Elizabeth were a part. And, but what was remarkable, see, because the anti-discrimination bill had not passed in the 1943 led territorial legislature, but it did pass in 45. What was the difference? The difference was for Elizabeth to be able to appeal not only to hearts and, and minds in one sense, but to really demonstrate how foolish it would be to not have an anti-discrimination bill. And so her speech was extremely effective in that way. Now, some have said there weren't any signs like that because we just can't find any pictures other than the one that the museum has um, white help only or something to that effect. And that would not be true. There's lots of oral history given by folks and written about. Um, I saw a statement in one article I was published in by Arla Sturgelewski about her aunt um, seeing those signs and being horrified by them. You know, no natives allowed. Uh, the fact that the theaters were segregated and they were the signage was certainly up front uh, making it clear that there was a native section and a non-native section so segregation was just everywhere and keeping native and non-native people apart so there was also the businesses and establishments and schools that would not allow uh, native peoples but there were the restaurants with the signs uh, that were and, and the theaters. And in fact, the A and B even boycotted the one in Wrangell. So the A and B and the A and S, and they were very effective. <laughs> and so there was lots of action going on. And this was part of it and part of what Roy and Elizabeth were involved with. But the difference was is that Roy and Elizabeth were writing all these amazing letters 
really pointing out the hypocrisy. You know, you can't have a free America and say, oh, but we're going to segregate uh, other people. They don't get to be in our place, our establishments. We have the right to decide who comes to our business or not. Well, that's common stuff that we saw throughout a uh, century, a couple centuries of the United States uh, eliminating uh, primarily Blacks from um, any, any kind of equality. And there's, so that's another one, you know, that, um, that there weren't signs and the signs, first of all, uh, I forgot to mention uh, Ernest Greening, Governor Greening, uh, that was one of the first things he saw when he went to Anchorage and he saw that the Anchorage Grill, I think I forget what it was called, Anchorage Grill something, and it had a very blatant sign about no natives and no Filipinos allowed. I believe that was the restaurant. One of the restaurants had that particular sign. And he addressed that and talked to the, to the owner. So they found uh, support in one another, Roy and Elizabeth and Governor Greening, as they proceeded because they all wanted this anti-discrimination bill. But Roy and Elizabeth moved to Juneau. They moved to Juneau because of this fight. They, it wasn't that they went there and were so surprised that things were going on. They already knew that. I mean, Peter, I'm in Petersburg, and just that we can stand on the mountain here on Metcalf Island and see Wrangell. That's how close it is. And Wrangell is where the theater was that was boycotted. So these were not not new things <laughs> for, for the people. So to dispel that, that uh, and to dispel the fact that uh, Elizabeth only only gave a speech because she certainly certainly did much more than that. It, it's and let's keep understand that context. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, women were not uh, in leadership roles at that time. So, and I believe you had a, a wonderful. I looked at it by the way, the suffragette uh, um, display yeah. that you had. Yeah, and yeah, it's actually up now, um, the Alaska Suffrage Star exhibit, and it's actually up at the high school now. So those students will be able to look at it all month long and learn a little bit more about like Tilly Paul and, and that family and yes. just how mm -hmm. unequal suffrage really was here in Alaska. So I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. It kind of adds to this overall context of how does uh, Elizabeth and her work really fit into that framework? Yes, it, it, it really does. Um, I mean, Elizabeth was unique in a, in a way as an individual. And I think this is what has confused people. And it's kind of funny. Um, I, I can't say that I went through exactly what she's been through in that regard, but I have a sense of it uh, because of how awful people can sometimes be to someone who is extremely attractive and poised. And, uh, and I might have had my my attraction kind of style when I was younger, but I don't know that I was as poised. Okay, and she was she was really re a refined kind of person, and she took that you know what was her her adopted family were the Wanamakers, but they uh, and some people think that they were uh, non-native. They were not non-native. They were they were very much native people. And they were just part of the church, which had been a major influence. Um, you know, two churches, Presbyterians and the Russian Orthodox. And they were uh, part of the Presbyterian. And it was through the Presbyterians' teachings, really, that a and and ANS grew. But they, uh, much to, I think, to the maybe chagrin of the Presbyterians, they kind of branched off on their own and became their own advocate for the rights of themselves. And so they were more than just good students acculturating, they were instead fighting back for the rights of their own people. And ultimately for really to make it possible for us to still have our language and our culture today in so many ways. They made that possible, I believe, uh, in, in, in their struggles and in their efforts. And that wasn't the intent when they first started, but it's what, um, and I don't think the Presbyterians actually had intended for that to be the case because they were very, uh, they're motivated by um, um, acculturation mm. of, of Indian people. 
But all that said, I think that dedication and their presence in the Wanamakers being both Christian and very much uh, a part of their own culture, because there's a wonderful picture of Andrew Wanamaker in full regalia. They spoke the language, so this was not something that Elizabeth didn't know. It's just that she knew how to function in the Western arena and dress the part, and she taught other women how to do the same so that you could maneuver in those kinds of environments without feeling inferior. And I think that was really kind of brilliant in my mind uh, in advance of things, you know, at that time. And uh, it's also, it made her so approachable and I think so powerful in the speech before the legislature. When she made that speech before the legislature, she turned their ears red. That's, that's exactly how it was stated in the Juno um, Daily Empire, at, as the paper was at that time. And so they were, they were pretty amazed that she struck back so effectively and in that very calm way. And I've interviewed people who, who are no longer with us, uh, but who were present um, at that time at the hearing. And so they told me little details that I never would have known that Elizabeth liked to knit, especially when she was nervous. So she was knitting during the hearing. And then when she got up to speak and that she would get nervous when she would speak, but she would. And I thought, gee, that's just like the way I am. You know, I get so nervous and scared when it's time to go on and, um, and give a speech or something. And I would, you know, have to calm down and, and, uh, and try to find that center and talk to my ancestors and try to, try to uh, make it happen. And she would, she would speak um, even through that nervousness. I got to know her husband when he was alive back in the eighties. And that's what first sparked my interest. And I'd met him. Yeah, I think that's definitely a question we have. I mean, you know, you yeah. spoke about how your lives kind of parallel a little bit. When did you first hear about Elizabeth's story and, and just how did this come about? You've mentioned, you know, some of the research and letters and interviews, but can you talk about when you first heard Elizabeth's story? And, and I know you're just about to start in on um, kind of learning about that. Can, uh, we'd love to hear. Yeah, I um, I first met Roy Pradovich Sr., her husband, when I was only 16, 15. And I was on my way to a boarding home after being in boarding school, Indian boarding school, like so many, and on my way to a boarding home in Fairbanks. And I got stuck in Anchorage overnight and I didn't know what to do because I'd never been in a city before. And, uh, but a lady uh, who was in Inupiaq, I believe, and she rescued me and kept me overnight and then um, took me to meet Roy Pradovich the next day. And, and he, I just saw this man who was looked bigger than life to me for some reason. And I didn't want to be that snotty brat I'd been for so much because I was such an angry young person. And then he says, stay in school, you know, in a deep voice, you know, and I, and I thought, okay. And, and I was, I was, uh, I'll never, I'll, I never forgot that for some reason. I thought, okay, I'll stay in school. And I did, and I graduated. And he, I ended up meeting him years later again in Anchorage, where I'd been living. And we would visit at his office, and he would show. He gave me copies of some speeches that he he uh, had made to the A and B. He talked to me about his wife, and I thought, boy, this man really loved his wife. I had no idea who she was or what she had done. I didn't know we even had that kind of history uh, for my own people, for thinking people. And I, all I knew was racism. And I'd, re I'd been confronted with it so much. And so for him to tell me about various things like that was, it became life-changing. I started investigating more. And that's when I got into it to the point where I spent two years while I was also doing touring for Nakahiti Theater, a Native Theater company at the time. 
and taking advantage of that touring to meet with people who knew Elizabeth. And it was such an experience. I thought I have to write something. I don't know what exactly. And I actually wrote uh, a bit of a full length play and was trying to get APU or somebody to, um, to produce it. And they were, they were excited about it, but we couldn't come up with a budget. So it didn't happen. And then fast forward 10 years, I, the Heritage Center in Anchorage approached me about maybe doing something. That's how my play, uh, My Spirit Raised Its Hands, uh, came to be, which I have ended up touring from all over Alaska, uh, all over the schools many times in Anchorage, and as well as from Hawaii on tour to as far as London. And so I performed it in I kept saying, I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm not going to do it anymore. But then the London thing came up or the, the, the one before that was, I mean, one in Washington, D.C. at the Kennedy Center. The, you know, it just, and the National um, Museum of the American Indian. So it was really a big um, deal to be able to share that story and feeling really honored to be able to do that. And I did it. Um, when I did it at the theater festival in London, that was, that was really special. But, but it was Roy and his words and his enthusiasm and finding out about Elizabeth and why it's so personally uh, meaningful is I was in many ways a bit of a mess. Um, I'd grown up with abuse I had been in and out of one foster home after another. I would run away from these non-native homes and run to the run away to Metlakatla. Um, I and this was out of Ketchikan. Um, I, you know, I was moved around uh, a lot. I went into, to these various foster homes that were some too often unregulated, and um, and so there was alcohol and all kinds of abuse and um, by these non-native families. So I, I was really, really angry, just a very angry um, and scared young person in many ways. And so I was a fighter. You know, I just would fight back as, as an impulse because I hadn't really been taught much of anything. So to find out that, um, you know, like how to be how to be a fine young woman. I had no idea. I knew how to swear like a truck driver, but I didn't know, you know, these other things. And so to learn about Elizabeth was a huge personal, it was a personal change for me because I thought we really could fight back with dignity. It never occurred to me that that could even be an approach. And in it, you know, because I cared about what the conditions that we were facing and how it impacted all of us. I cared about the well being of my own people. Um, and at that time, you know, even in my lifetime, it was, it was those early first 20 years of my life, where they were not good. So, Elizabeth's story really was life changing for me. And I aspired to be a better person because of her. And that in co combination with an elder thinking woman who really in many ways took me under her wing as a young adult and uh, who is really funny, just really funny and, uh, and non-judgmental as could be. And, I, and uh, between those two, I think I, I became a better human being, I like to think. No, that's fantastic. And and what has been, I mean, you mentioned the show in London and in Washington. Um, mm -hmm. What's the impact and reception been like to your play outside of Alaska? Oh, really good. In fact, one of the most memorable uh, was when I performed at the Bishop's Museum in, ha in Honolulu, Hawaii. And it was primarily all Hawaiian people in the audience. And after I performed, uh, and I thought, okay, we, we could, you know, I could entertain questions and stuff and sit on the stage and have conversation with them like 
I usually did. And they, they, they were crying. And I hadn't had quite that emotional of a response from an audience. I've had some amazing responses from audiences, but this was really, really deeply emotional. And I had to know why. And, and when I asked, they said, it's because we never talk about this. This is our story too. Oh, no, it just really was overwhelming. I mean, I was, I think I was in tears too by the end, but the, it was, it was there, it was so hurtful and difficult because that's what, that's what discrimination is. It's that living in that, sh in, in shame or fear, or anger or, or, or self-hatred, you know, that those are, those are the kinds of things um, that happen as a result. And so that marginalization from the broader society. And, and so they really felt that hurt, but they hadn't really talked about it openly. And that was really profound to hear. Um, I mean, you, you mentioned it earlier with like the Alaska Suffrage Star exhibit, kind of exploring those ideas of um, inequality here in Alaska and uh, your play and things like the the dollar coin and even uh, you know the Google Doodle last year that featured Elizabeth. Yeah. Um, right. So what do you hope people will continue to take away? Maybe especially women and girls who might be you know in that same uh, like a young Diane as far as you know angry and trying to understand you know the broader context of the world they live in through this. What do you hope that they'll take away from your play and from Elizabeth's story? I think they. You know, these are really challenging times we're in right now, obviously. And um, what I see playing out today is, is this constant us against them. This was not the approach that the Alaska Native Brotherhood or Sisterhood had or Roy and Elizabeth. And it was far more effective to find allies and to work together for the common good. And that's one of the things everybody benefited out of the anti-discrimination bill. When you think about it, everyone benefits. And it's not, you know, you don't know what your family makeup is going to be tomorrow. You know, that's, and, and you might wish that, that things were more equal uh, at that point if you hadn't been. And, you know, there's different ways to marginalize people for different reasons. It all amounts to the same thing. It all amounts to division and hurt. Nobody wins. And so I, I like to think that these kinds of stories and, and knowing this kind of history, it should be inspiring and useful for better ways to handle issues so that we actually grow from the experience, not just be right in the experience. Well, I'm sure there are, you know, through your play and touring, even just around Anchorage and Alaska, there's so many, there's a generation now of school children who've, you know, grown up and have seen that present, you know, presentation, they've seen your play. Um, can you speak a little bit to, um, you know, you talked a little bit about how Elizabeth's influenced your own life. You're not just a playwright actress. You mentioned, you know, truck driver. We added a little bit yeah. more into the intro. Uh, but can you talk about how, I, I almost feel like you took this a step further and you did run for office and you are involved you know, in politics and so many other civic projects. Can you tell us a little bit about how Elizabeth influenced your position on some of these different things? I think because I have deep um, and emotional connection and feelings about issues and about the well-being of people, especially those who are marginalized or um, that I don't believe in just being, um, uh, treating people as disposable. You know, the homeless are not disposable. Um, you know, a drug addict is not somebody to throw away. There's somebody who needs help and healing. So it, and, and, and so on. Um, you might want to refresh, uh, because I, I start going down rabbit holes, so just... <laughs> No, so no might... completely, completely. And, and I think we should note. So, I mean, when, when my spirit raised its hand, 
that isn't just, you know, the only play or thing you've written. I mean, you've got a body no, of, work of poetry that's fantastic. And um, can you talk a little bit about, um, oh, goodness. Uh, oh, this is uh, your segue. <laughs> yes, this is my, my not so smooth segue. Some of your other <laughs> work. Um, so, I mean, beyond uh, okay. the play about Elizabeth. I'll, I'll do I'll do a little show and tell here. Yes, time. please, please. Because I, I studied theater, which I never dreamed of doing. I always wanted to be a truck driver. And then I wanted to go to school to be a diesel mechanic. And I didn't get the opportunity because they said I'd already used my funding, uh, any, any some particular track of funding from the Bureau of Indian Affairs at the time. And so I said, well, what should I do then? I want to be a diesel mechanic. They said, you could go to the university or, you know, and I said, and study what? Something sissy like theater? And they said, yes. And I thought, fine, then that's what I'll do because I'm that, I was that kind of stubborn. And I had no idea what theater was and what people did in it. And I was the only native in it, you know, so it was really quite a journey. But I ended up getting my degree in it, and, you know, after working on a degree for journalism and justice and all kinds of stuff. But um, so on, this is one of the little theater books I'm published in, Monologues for Actors of Color. I've got a piece in there. Um, this is also has, uh, this is public, this one piece is published elsewhere. There's a, a monologue I did called River Woman, which is really fun. There's the stories in there. Uh, Spruce Tips in the Fog, which I wrote. Um, so it's a vanity press kind of thing, but it's um, there, they have it in the library here. Um, it sold I, an art shop in Anchorage. I may, had 10, 100 copies published and they all sold in that one art shop. So I guess I still should get that republished. Yeah, and we, we did share. So um, we have you reading a little bit from uh, the Spruce Tips book. Uh, I believe we shared oh. last week um, you were on a radio special uh, reading some of that. Oh, so we're, that's we're right. In here in Petersburg. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that was, I think, the three days of Raven story. Yes. Yeah. And then this, this is the most recent I helped to, uh, I was one of the uh, contributing editors, and then there's some poetry in here, but this has been really well received nationally. So this is quite a book. It's, if you can't see it for the audience, when the light of the world was subdued, our songs came through. So the book itself is uh, edited by Ro uh, Joy Harjo. I dearly love. Whoa. Yeah. And we'll make certain too, um, because we do have, you know, the question of comms, we'll make certain to share uh links and, and the titles of these books. Um, and beyond the books, too, you've been involved in film too. And then there was this uh, you know, publishing this. Actually, the most important one I'm just gonna have to reach Yes, out yeah, it. please. Is uh oh, that's a different one. Um, I guess I do have a few things. <laughs> Maybe too many. This is, there's, there's work in here, Alaska Native Writers, Storytellers, and orator, Orators. These are anthologies. And then I think the most important one is, uh, sorry, <laughs> is sharing our stories of survival. This was actually, I was the poetry editor for this and I also wrote a chapter. But um, this is when we really addressed the issues of violence against Native women uh, mm -hmm. before it became anything of a popular subject. In fact, um, in my advocacy on uh, violence against Native women in particular, I am a survivor in full disclosure, but, and I have not, um, it took a while, but I, I decided I'm not going to be silent about that fact. But I had people who tried to, even my own people who tried to, um, because they don't like how unpleasant it is and they don't want us to be viewed as, as victims, as um, in that we're just a ne negative, you know, a negative imagery about us that we're many other things. Of course we are, but we can't deny the fact. And now it's so widespread as, as news and as a movement. But when we put this out and UCLA was using this in their legal program, the, um, uh, and this is through Tribal Law and Policy Institute, but we were going ahead and we, been addressing the issues of violence against Native women. And because of these efforts, um, I, I, I was honored to receive the Bonnie Heavy Runner Award for my advocacy, but, um, you know, and humbled by it. But, you know, it, it's just driven by the fact that we need, we, we needed to break the silence. 
that was my effort. And we six obviously were successful because now young people feel like it's totally appropriate to be talking about these things. So that's a real transformation from where we were when this book came out, which was, I think, 2008. So, and then there's, um, oh, this is a piece, uh, I forgot which book this was, because there was, a, <laughs> um, this is the one with, um, where I talk about Elizabeth Pradovich in, uh, in, a, in another context, really around education. Uh, and because that was what she wanted to be, actually. I don't know if anybody knows that, but she, her, her ambition was to be a teacher. And life just kept driving her in another direction. And I know that feeling too. So <laughs> that's some of that stuff. And if you want to know about films, here's a few that. Yeah, you know, yeah. Because I mean, you, you really show storytelling throughout. Um, yeah. There, there's one that I saw listed because we, we, we love to see, you know, all the things you've been involved with. Um, in 1999, that was one of the first films to feature Clinkett dialogue and storytelling. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? I know you had a role in that. Oh, film which well. one are you talking? Uh, the, uh, the, the, the tree uh, system. Oh, Kusal Haquan. Oh. Yeah, that's this one. Yeah, I got to play a monster. And uh, so I was the cannibal giant and I was the tree sister. So I'm highly featured in this film as a tree and as a cannibal. But, <laughs> but and it took two and a half hours to put that makeup on for the cannibal giant. And, um, but there were, I don't know what it is. I think it's because I've always liked to play, you know? And uh, when you're a kid, I mean, what's more fun than playing a monster? And I, and so I got to play a monster and she was really some of the gnarly fingers, nails and skin and, and uh, drooling and white eyes, you know, they had to order special uh, uh, lenses for my eyes to produce that effect and and then uh, but I'll never forget I, I just got so into it that these little things would come to mind to do as this monster you know and it's like when she's got a little blood on her from grabbing the the young man and throwing him up against a tree and then licks it <laughs> <You know? laughs> I was like oh. I scared myself when I went to the theater and saw it I was like oh my god <laughs> Anyway, and we did a number of films through the Alaska Heritage. This is, but they weren't films; they were plays that we we did. And there were four of us that were the primary actors that really launched um, the Nakahiti Theater in its very most successful period. And we toured our own communities, but when it tried to branch out into the greater world, I don't think it was quite as successful because other motivations took over. When we were doing it for our own, that's when I wanted to be with it. When we branched out, I didn't, I no longer wanted to be with it. But, so I wasn't, but, but, um, but Nakahiti, when it was for our people and about us, it was wonderful because it, I could see our own people being lifted up and that, that we have a phrase for that, you know, and that's, and I think that's the way to be, to lift each other up. And so Nati Fene, that was me and Gary Wade, Chris Makua, uh, who is no longer with us, um, and James Williams. We were, we were the main, we were the team. Oh, of course, people know about this. Oh, my little role in White Fang. I, I still get residuals from this to this day. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then Christmas with a capital C where I play a judge. So. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, it, how did it come about then? Because, uh, you know, one of the other things we, you mentioned it earlier is you did play Elizabeth in the PBS documentary. Yeah, um, so how did that record. role come about? Did they automatically know to contact you because of your play? Um, actually, I, I started that. Film. Really? Yes. And it was uh, Jeff Silverman, uh, because the newspapers, after seeing my play and everybody loving it so much, um, especially the people, they said in a, and I've got the copy of the news article somewhere, but the, because I've got a whole box of news articles and about all this stuff, but the, the, uh, they said this should be a film. 
And then Jeff Silverman contacted me and said, uh, and we'd both been through the same MFA program, but his was in a different area of, of er, different discipline than mine, but we were both in the creative writing program. And we both graduated from that uh, Master of Fine Arts. And, uh, and Jeff said he really wanted to do a movie, you know, but we can have to go after some money and can I, so we sat at my kitchen table and we drafted out on index cards, which I still have, because uh, I don't throw those kinds of things away, and laid them out. And we kept determining how we were going to create this film. And since I'd already done all this research and had the stories about Gnome and about, you know, Elizabeth and the, and the play, because we used this, my script um, to build that and my research to build it. And then added on more, of course, you know, with uh, making sure that we we had enough stuff, and because now it's going to be an hour long film, just about. And uh, so we went to work on it. The only reason why I ended up not, because if you look at the credits, you know, my name's on there something like five times, but the um, is is that I didn't see it through to the end, other than to complete my, my, the necessary parts, which is playing the role. But the, um, I would have stayed in with the production stuff as well, because I did some of the interviews that you see, like the one with Nora Dauenhauer, that I did that. And I was um, guiding a lot of stuff in that, in that film. Even though I'm not surprised that the woman didn't get any credit, you know, for, for that effort but um um nevertheless <laughs> yeah, we can make certain we'll we'll link um so you can access that um for the rights of all the uh, pbs special we'll put it in the comments and there's also an excellent um uh, teaching and conversation guide so if you're a teacher who's watching this or, or you just want to have a kind of a guided discussion about it uh you, you can of course listen to this interview and this conversation with diane and also check that out too to give you more context to what you're viewing. So the film, I think we did the, in fact, the other thing uh, is that we, our director, Lucas, um, I think his name is Phil Lucas, he, he's the one who did that groundbreaking film. Um, oh gosh, it's just across the way here in Canada uh, um, on alcoholism. And he was, and he, it was an award-winning project and he's, he was our director for, for the rights of all. And uh, he passed away in, during the shoot. And I was so, you know, just so saddened over that. And so the, the, the footage is a little different from in some areas than what it would have been just because of that he was such a excellent director. Yeah, and, and one thing I'm curious about too, we've talked a little bit about film too. Um, another more personal story for you that you created was um, Mother America Blue. Can you talk just a little bit? I know that we can go to questions in the comments there, but we'd yeah. love to hear about some of uh, your work after that play. So uh, Mother America Blue, and, and if you can just tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, I, I did um, three pieces that were one woman show pieces that became easier as Jeannie Green would tell me it's easier to, you know, because I was, I ran a talent agency. I don't know if you know that for a decade. And I promoted Alaska Native talent primarily and Alaska talent in general. So I had people hired out as far away as New Zealand and feature film and some other place. You know, they were all over. Um, but it was hard to, you know, it was hard work, 16 hour days often. And so Jeannie Green said, why don't you just do you? And because uh, I was getting exhausted. So I thought that was crazy, but then I thought, okay. And so I ended up doing all these other things. Um, and I wrote these three pieces. One was River Woman, um, which I love that piece, and the uh, and published in one of these books. Uh, the um, And then I wrote, I mean, I'd already written the, the Elizabeth play, so, um, My Spirit Raises Sands. And then the, the, the third piece was written five weeks before I was supposed to go perform in in, in London, <laughs> it's like I'm out of my mind, but I just didn't like the third piece I had, and they needed to know what was the, 
they really needed to know the title. So I was like, oh God, Mother America Blue. But it's a piece, a very personal, most personal gut-wrenching piece I think I've ever written. And there's been a few, but this one was about my son who was severely injured in Iraq um, in November of 2005. And I um, wrote that piece uh, in because my life, I felt like it had changed writing on that flight with a with a with wounded, a plane full of wounded uh, from the, the Iraq war. And they had sent us uh, over because uh, DOD, because they didn't think that my son was going to survive. And so we went on that journey that went took us for a few months to Walter Reed Army Medical um, after we got out of Germany, uh, uh, after he was released there. Um, and it was, and it was that journey that I wrote, um, that play was based on. I mean, it was the ways in which the other wounded responded to my son because he was the one in the worst condition um, with multiple tubes and no, questionable whether he would survive the flight. In fact, they even had a doctor waiting for us at um, Walter Reed Army Medical um, which we thought that was nice that he was there, but we found out a few months later that as they told us and as he told us, the real intent was to comfort the family because they didn't think that my son would survive the flight. So, but those, those uh, wounded warriors on that, on that flight would, you know, the things that they said, they were so profound and, and, and struck me so, to the heart and kept me going actually because I was devastated and uh, one would say you know I put in a 911 call to God for your son and other things that um, the guys would say but I mean this one guy he, he called me over and that's how it got started he called me over to him and he said um and I, I, I didn't know what to do. I was just so distraught, but I got up because I saw him waving to me and I went over to him and he was on a gurney. There were a number of them on gurneys and he said, and he was on the top gurney and he said, is that your son? And I said, yes. And he says, I'm praying for him. And I asked him what had happened to him because he's such a handsome boy and, and he had like little tiny shrap shrapnel wounds on his face and his, but his leg had been shattered. And he was in a great deal of pain. I talked with him. Next thing I know, the guy below him asked if I wouldn't mind getting his backpack for him. And then he's sharing with me his feelings about the war. And then another is asking me questions. And then I end up going down the line because they all wanted somebody. And when I got to the last guy, he was, um, he said that, he had, he was a reservist, so he had nothing and he, his wife had left him. He didn't know where he was going to go. And I was just beside myself listening to him and, and then he asked if he could have a hug. And so I gave him a hug, but it, it, um, it changed me. It really impacted me. Um, as it always does, you know, when you really are face to face with, with the kinds of horror that we rain on one another with what we ask of them and what we, and the way we respond negatively, uh, whether it's to each other as individuals or to other countries. So I, I've seen the price in multiple ways. And of course I'm going to address it. And of course I'm going to say something and um, and even if I don't expect myself to be a perfect human being, and sometimes I have my days, but I figure if you just keep your heart in the right place and always try to think, even if it's hard, try to think better of other people. <laughs> no, thank you so much for sharing. I mean, I mean, I can't imagine what that first London audience, you know, uh, felt in, you know, uh, you really transcribing that experience on that plane into a one woman show, into something that you were presenting for oh, them. They were, they were so overwhelmed. I thought 
well, they, it was a great reception. They all applauded and I went off stage to go pack up my stuff. Um, and I came back out so I could pick up the props. And the audience was still there, sitting in, it was actually in, still in the dark. And I said, do we need to talk? And, and then, the, you know, I was like, to the light crew, to put the lights up. And, and, um, and we did for an hour and a half. It wasn't even the night of, for the after post-show discussion. That was for Saturday night. This is the opening night. And I was like, oh my gosh. Had the best conversation I've ever had with an audience. And it was really alarm, kind of surprising because the British, many of the British people in the audience said, gosh, we, we'd never heard a story like this from the United States. It, it, it just blows our minds. But I used a lot of stuff in that. It was a multimedia piece. I loved working with multimedia. So there were photo images out of Iraq with my son you know, things like that. There was, um, you know, a rap song that was in it that was done by soldiers in Iraq at the time. And, you know, this kind of thing. And it was, it was real. It was real. And it was, and then it was also my drum was my son. So my son, my, the drum is on the gurney. And, and it, you know, so it has this emotional and tie-ins to things. It flows from her talking to the audience about the, you know, how wonderful her boy was. And he's a little boy on the screen behind me, you know, and, um, and remembering those precious things about your little boy. And then it was, you know, there's the poetry, you know, kind of a edgy poem that really takes you to mom's experience. Mm. As as he's going through his his. No, it's, it, now is there anywhere that uh, folks can read Mother America Blue? Is that something that we can look forward to? I I have, I, I can consider it, but I haven't, I have not, ever after I did it in for Veterans Day in Anchorage, where it was really well received, uh, and then most importantly, very well received by the veterans and military guys that were in the room who came to see the play and it spoke to them for real. They got it. And, um, and that meant everything to me, but uh, I, and I also perform, you know, the other person that was performing, I asked him, could you please do a story? You know, cause you're so awesome. And he was a world war II veteran. And that would be the last thing that he would do. Cause he passed away not mm. long after that. But and so, and it's weird because he's buried in the cemetery, not far from friends of mine who are at the, you know, the National Cemetery in Anchorage and from two of my uncles, three of my uncles, they're all, wow. they're all in the same area. And uh, wow. which is, it, but it makes it a very special place for me to visit. For certain. Um, so it, we have a little bit of time to go to the comments. Yeah. Um, Anybody. I'm, I'm checking with Marnie off to the side here. Okay. okay. Um, so one of the questions uh, we have is you've been a playwright, truck driver, talent agent, activist, et cetera. What's next? What are your future goals? Thanks. I guess we could call me next thing as a historian, perhaps. <laughs> I've, I've been working on a history book for the university, but I'm not right. I'm not the, the writer. I just worked on a chapter and helping edit and whatnot different aspects of things, but being a contributor on that um, has just really sparked my interest to do more because I've always enjoyed history. What I don't find very much is our own history told with the truth that um, and the kind of knowledge that, that we possess. And I think it's time to change that. And uh, and I, I'm not interested in just the over-the-top academic writing. Uh, I want people to read it. So that's, you know, so maybe kind of like a, a, a think it person's history of Alaska or something, like the people's history. So, um, and I've been really enjoying myself with that. That's, that's, and, but on the other hand, you know, I got sidetracked right now because I got asked to, to audition for a film and now they, now I'm in callback and I'm thinking, oh, geez, 
We hope so, to see more from you. Yeah, both on stage and so I don't know. Video. <laughs> I'm trying to stay out of that business, but <laughs> you get drawn back in. Well, well, Diane, I do. I want to thank you so much for spending time and sharing so much of yourself with us today. And then just through the body of your work, um, I know that it's made an impact on so many of those school children right on up uh, of those people who saw you portray Elizabeth on stage uh, and really helped share that story with them. Um, so thank you so much to Diane. Um, We'll, we'll let her go, we've held her on. And uh, we do hope that you'll join us uh, next month, our audience uh, here on Museum Midday, when we'll be talking with the Hayek Foundation out of uh, Metlakatla and learning a little bit more about what it is that they do and their resources. So again, thank you all so much for joining us with this Museum Midday. And many, many thanks uh, to Diane Benson, who was gracious enough to join us today. So thank you so much, take care. <laughs>